Good morning, everybody. It's Wednesday, September 25th, 5.26 a.m. Central Time. Grain markets are lower this morning. December corn futures down two and three quarters at 4.09. November soybeans down 10 and a quarter at 10.32. December Chicago wheat down two and three quarters at 5.75 and a quarter. December Kansas City wheat is down five at 5.66. December spring wheat down six and a half at 6.05 and a quarter. Let's start off with this stimulus package. So China has unveiled its largest stimulus package since the pandemic in hopes of reviving its economy. The stimulus will lower interest rates, pump more funds into the economy, and reduce home mortgage repayment burdens. Some analysts believe the stimulus may not be enough to help the economy due to weak credit demand for, from consumers and businesses. Analysts also claim that the plan is missing policies that support true economic activity. In response to the announcement, the yuan jumped to a 16-month high against the U.S. dollar, and the Chinese stock market saw its largest spike in more than two years. Soybean futures rallied sharply early on Tuesday on ideas that the stimulus could result in larger Chinese imports. A lot of the activity in the markets that we saw early on the excitement about this stimulus kind of faded. Like the Chinese stock market rally faded. The soybean rally faded. Um, China, they're going to cut rates. They're going to um, actually on existing home mortgages, they're going to reduce rates by 50 basis points and then also reduce down payment requirements. They've got a real property crisis in China, and that's part of this. Their growth projections are not very good. And uh, the economists who uh, lar largely everything I saw in, in print was that this just isn't enough and it's probably not going to do much to really uh, help the Chinese economy. So I think this is absolutely part of the reason we saw the big pump in soybeans early yesterday. These headlines were out a couple hours or maybe an hour before we taped yesterday. So we didn't get to this, but um, it we rallied and then we faded. So now this morning, we're more than 20 cents off the high in the soybean market. So not necessarily the best look. I'm not saying the rally's over, but not the best look that we rejected this. Uh, one other thing that I'll say with regard to the soybean market is that there's a little bit more rain in the forecast for Brazil this morning. These rains in central Brazil, which are not super widespread, but in this time frame from October 5th through October 11th, this is stuff that I wasn't seeing in the GFS yesterday that I am seeing this morning. So I think part of like this little downward correction you're seeing in the soybean market um, just uh, late yesterday and into this morning is partially maybe they got too excited about this stimulus thing. And then maybe you've got some additional rain in the forecast. Legislation has been proposed that will benefit farmers through the 45Z tax credit. The bipartisan bicameral bill known as the Farmer First Fuel Incentives Act would restrict the eligibility for the 45Z tax credit to renewable fuels produced only from domestically sourced feedstocks. The bill would also extend the tax credit to a full 10-year credit. That extension would provide a financial incentive for the ethanol industry to expand production. It would also open up new markets for farmers farmers and provide enough time for infrastructure development so the U.S. can become less reliant on foreign fuel. According to lawmakers, if 45Z were to go into effect today, it would subsidize Chinese cooking oil and essentially eliminate the use of domestically produced soy and corn oil in renewable diesel. This bill is absolutely fantastic. It's two pages long, which uh, you see a lot of these government bills and they're like 500 pages or like a thousand pages. This bill is two pages long and it has two provisions. They want to essentially eliminate foreign feedstocks, get rid of this used cooking oil, all this nonsense, and rely on domestically grown corn, soybeans, whatever. And then secondly, they want to extend it and, and make it a 10-year um, a deal, essentially. Both items are fantastic. It has some bipartisan support. A lot of these um, bills don't become law. Maybe it becomes law, maybe it doesn't. We're still waiting on the Treasury guidance regarding 45Z, and they're way too late with that. So I guess Doc Marshall from Kansas was one of the guys who kind of uh, pushed this. This was a quote that he had in the um, uh, write-up. The 10-year credit will give the ethanol industry the time and financial incentive to build up the infrastructure needed for the U.S. to be less reliant on foreign fuel, open new markets for farmers, and increase ethanol production across the Midwest. And that's what we really need to see is increased ethanol production across the Midwest because that's how you increase your demand base for corn grown in the United States. Ethanol is kind of flatlined here. USDA says that we're just going to be kind of unchanged year over year in terms of um, uh, corn demand via ethanol, and we need to see that number higher. So it's fantastic. I love the bill. It's simple. It's easy to read. It has two big provisions. Uh, we hope that they can turn that into law. So if you guys have not checked out our premium content, you sure need to do so. Joe, can you tell me about yesterday's premium video with Pete Meyer? Pete Meyer was on yesterday. We did about 40 minutes of discussion regarding 
the Chinese stimulus, uh, biofuels, markets, grain marketing, market direction. Pete has some ranges in mind that he's kind of eyeing in the corn and soybean markets. A um, lot of stuff here, a lot of great questions that came in from subscribers. Pete's on every two weeks. We do these kind of like uh, longer form discussions. Uh, we cover questions that come in from subscribers. I'll tell the subscriber, hey guys, Pete's coming on tomorrow. Uh, what questions do you have? Brian Split's going to be on today doing charts. It's uh, fantastic stuff as always. If you guys want to see the premium stuff, go to standardgrain.com. You can sign up this morning. It's a $50 per month subscription. You can cancel at any time. No other fee, no other obligation. Nobody will try to sell you anything else. You'll get our morning email every single business day at 5 a.m. Central Time. It includes all the headlines, all of our graphics, charts, all of my cash grain marketing recommendations, all the premium videos. There's a new premium video every single business day. Uh, give that deal a shot this morning, guys. Grain workers went on strike at Canada's largest port on Tuesday. Negotiations broke down last week between the Grain Workers Union and the Vancouver Terminal Elevators Association due to an impasse over benefits. The strike will impact the six main grain terminals located in the Canadian port of Vancouver. Last year, about 52% of all the grain produced in Canada passed through the port. The strike has the potential to prevent 100,000 metric tons of grain from being delivered to the port's terminals each day, and daily losses could reach $26 million. The sort of these sort of logistical constraints, especially when they're man-made, are never good. They'll result in in poorer basis, and some of this could even trickle into the U.S. When it comes to wheat, um, you could find some some Canadian wheat that may have been exported showing up in the United States. It's just it's it's not good. I hope to get it resolved. Speaking of strikes, about 45,000 dock workers may soon go on strike at ports along the East and Gulf Coast. Uh, the strike is set to begin on October 1st when the contract between the International Longshoremen's Association and the United States Maritime Alliance expires. The strike would close 36 ports, which handle over half of the nation's goods transported in containers by cargo ships. The strike is not expected to last longer than a week. However, a week-long strike could cost the economy up to $7.5 billion. Products ranging from electronics to agricultural goods are expected to be impacted. With regard to agriculture, this should not be a huge deal. Mike Steenhook is the executive director of the Soy Transportation Coalition. He said this, the negotiations would not impact the overwhelming majority of soybean and grain exports from the Gulf or East Coast. However, it would impact uh, the soybeans, soybean meal, and other egg products that are exported via container and could also have a significant impact on chilled or frozen meat, eggs, et cetera, that are exported from the U.S. So um, maybe for some items, it's a big deal, but for like big picture soybean shipments, corn shipments shouldn't be the biggest deal in the world. Corteva profits are slated to decline due to crop concerns in South America. Dry conditions are inhibiting corn planting in Argentina, and more dryness is expected as the La Nina weather pattern develops. Concerns have also been raised over Brazil's drought, which is hindering soybean planting, as we've talked about. If dry uh, conditions continue, the planting of Brazil's second corn crop could be delayed, which could impact yields. However, it's still too early to tell if the dry conditions will have a significant impact in Brazil. Corteva had previously pegged its 2024 profit forecast between $3.4 billion and $3.6 billion. Corteva, of course, was previously Dow AgroSciences and, and Pioneer, and they spun off into this publicly traded company, I believe, in 2018. It was like six years ago. Their stock is uh, doing all right. I mean, the company's doing fine. They're up 21% year to date. Um, not really much correlation here that I can see between the farm economy, which is in a full-blown recession, and uh, the Corteva stock. So I guess they have some concerns, but they appear to be doing okay to me uh, for the time being, at least. What did cattle do yesterday? Cattle futures were mostly higher. Live cattle were down five cents to 57 cents higher. Feeders were down 15 cents to a buck 32 higher. Box beef was mostly unchanged. Choice ended the day at 301.89. That was up eight cents. And select ended the day at 286.87. That was da down 92 cents. Outside markets are pretty quiet. U.S. dollars about flat. Stocks are about flat, although I believe we saw record closes in the S&P and the Dow Jones again yesterday. Bonds are off just a little bit. Precious metals are mixed. Crude oil is down 48 cents in the November WTI at 7109. Have a great day, guys. We'll talk to you on Thursday.